Hello everyone, I'm Michael Serapio and welcome to Profile. Tonight, we are not focusing on one person, but rather on one event, the Halifax International Security Forum. In its short 15-year history, this gathering of leaders and thinkers from across North America and Europe has become one of the world's most preeminent security meetings, with a focus that is very important for Canada and for Canadians protecting democracy. Tonight, you will hear leaders and delegates talk about the countries and players that are challenging democracy. But first, a quick conversation with Janice Stein. The founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto, Janice Stein is also a founding member of the Halifax International Security Forum and its current board chair. Janice, always good to see you. Thank you for joining us. And great to be with you in person, I Michael. know, in person here in Halifax. Yes. Listen, I, I want to first and foremost talk about the, found, the founding of this forum, because you were very instrumental in that. You were one of the founders of, the, of this gathering. Why was it important to create? So this was created 15 years ago, Michael, and it has become the premier international security forum for North America. Uh, the original vision was to do exactly that so that Canada has a voice at the table in discussing issues that are on the agenda but also proactively in setting the agenda. That was the vision. What, among the many things that distinguishes the Halifax Forum is we have a large delegation of senators and Congress people from the House that came every year and are coming this year despite uh, the threat of a shutdown. John McCain was one of the original leaders of that delegation and it is the largest collection of legislators from the United States that come to Canada. So it provides a unique opportunity for Canadians to engage. So when you look back at the forum uh, across the last 15 years, what would you say it has achieved concretely? So it has been an agenda setter, both in terms of helping others understand what the security agenda is from Washington's perspective. That is a long-standing role, but still so important as we transition to a different world. And secondly, it has done something that is unique globally. This is the only security forum for democracies, which was also part of the original vision. So yes, China is not invited. Russia is not invited. This is the place globally for democracies to come together and ask, how do we meet our security challenges in a way that is appropriate for democracies? Now, you mentioned Russia, you mentioned China, and really the focus of this year is meant to be uh, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. Why that grouping? Why that focus in 2023-24? So the forum is putting a new piece of jargon on the table, crinks, in China, Russia. Uh, Iran and North Korea. Why that, Michael? Because it connects the conflicts that are roiling the security agenda. Ukraine is the obvious one. Um, Russia launched that invasion, but Iran has stepped up to supply Russia with missiles and drones. The war between Israel and Hamas. Iran is playing a big role, a coordinating role in that war, and Russia has stepped up to lead a, a major disinformation campaign. So it's about pulling the threads together and understanding how the global security order is realigning. Well, you, you mentioned Israel and Hamas. How does the current conflict affect this gathering? Oh, there's no question, Michael, that it is shaping the agenda. There will be at least one plenary session, if not more, devoted to it. Um, there are interesting things that we learn from the conflict 
uh, in Ukraine that are relevant to understanding the war between Israel and Hamas. Yes, these are in two different parts of the world, but the forum will draw attention to what does Israel need to learn from Ukraine about how it fights as a democracy. Ukraine has done that. And secondly, what do we need to learn about the threads that are tying that conflict together? So it's reshaped the agenda. There's no question. Well, we are watching. Again, always appreciate the time. Thank you for walking us through the forum. It's a pleasure, Michael. Now, as Janice Stein stated, and as expected, Israel and Hamas did become one of the recurring themes of this year's security forum. And one of the more prominent speakers at the summit was former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. In the year 2000, he traveled to Camp David to meet with then U.S. President Bill Clinton and Palestinian Authority Chairman Yasser Arafat. The goal? ending the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now, that effort failed, but Barak still says he believes in a two-state solution, though he also says that possibility cannot be implemented right now. You were saying in the discussion that ultimately you believe in the two-state solution, but of course the current prime minister has expressed serious reservations about it. What do you say to Netanyahu's reservation to a two-state solution? Uh, first of all, uh, the first thing that I said in, uh, in this session is that it's not the right time. Our youngsters, uh, when, while we are speaking, it's already night in Israel, they are getting into the tunnel, getting into those buildings where can can expect a, a kind of a terrorist behind every corner they have to, to be the first to pull the trigger. That's not the right timing, so to speak, to talk about future intentions in the in the uh, longer term but uh, having having said that uh, i might say might say that uh, Tanya is wrong and i'm right that uh, i cannot say a lot more <laughs> the po problem is that uh, he is slightly more than half of the uh, people and he's prime minister and i'm a former prime minister but i'm not active now in politics and and somewhat less than half of the public support my position. I think that they are blind uh, to the realities. And when I explain that Israel uh, should be interested in two-state uh, solution, not because of justice for the Palestinians, because of our own uh, interest, our own uh, future, our own security, our own identity. We need it because Israel is established in order to become a Zionist democratic, liberal democracy, I believe, um, in its nature. And that's, that's not the case going to happen if we, if we control over the whole area, it will become either non-Jewish or non-democratic and neither of these. Uh, is the Zionist dream. If you were to follow the, the, the current course that we're seeing uh, Israel carry out in its war against Hamas, what do you think will happen? Will Israel have to reoccupy? Will it have to go to an international force? How, how do you see this unfolding? It's not, no one in Israel really intends, uh, probably ex ex except for the extreme right-wing uh, kind of uh, zealots, uh, no one expects Israel to take over and hold the, the Gaza Strip with, with over 2 million uh, Palestinians for the next 10 or 20 years. So we all think of making the operation, uh, however it uh, might take, it probably takes several months to fully uh, make sure that, uh, that Hamas military capabilities had been erased and it has no uh, capacity to reign over the, uh, over the Gaza Strip. So uh, we think of this term as a term that we will be there, not occupy it forever, but we will be there for several months. And I personally believe that the right answer for the day after is that while we are fighting there, together with the Americans and the whole axis of moderate forces in the Middle East, uh, may, may, mainly the Sunnite um, autocracies, uh, Egypt and uh, Jordan, uh, MBS, Saudi Arabia, MBZ, the Emirates, probably in a different way also the Qataris because their finance cloud, financial cloud can help, uh, that they, the Arab uh, group will establish a multinational Arab force that uh, will be ready to take over the 
um, Gaza Strip from us once we, we destroy the Hamas capabilities uh, for a limited period, let's say three or six months, backed by Arab League resolution, probably even uh, United uh, Nations Security Council resolution if the Russians will not veto it, and uh, take over the Gaza Strip and bring back the original owner, so to speak, uh, internationally recognized owner, which is the Palestinian Authority. They are now in the West Bank, but bring them there and help them probably stay another three months or six to help them to make sure that they are capable of holding it. That might be the solution. Of course, it contradicts the present government position that they do not want to feed them. And I think that they are wrong. And <laughs> I'm right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that the only realistic uh, solution uh, that will uh, save uh, Israel the experience of coming once again to control uh, two million or whatever uh, Palestinians that uh, take care of everything from social security, education, sewage, uh, supply for babies or for hospitals. So that should be reigned by Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And of course we should make uh, many arrangements on the, on the security side, both uh, along the uh, barrier, probably a uh, cordon sanitaire a few hundred meters beyond the, the um, barrier to make sure that uh, what we experienced in the uh, October 7th cannot ever repeat itself. That's our main interest. To make sure that this uh, phenomenon of seven, uh, the slaughtering of 1,200 uh, people, reduction of another 250, cannot never. Uh, uh, cannot happen ever again. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, a precursor to that, and you said it, is to make sure that Hamas loses control, never gets back power again in, in yeah. Gaza. Yeah. With both your political and your military background, what is that actually going to take? Because right now, we're, as reported, uh, thousands of civilian casualties as a result of this operation. What will it actually take, do you think, to get rid of Hamas and make sure they don't take power again in Gaza? It will take uh, more time and uh, toil and sweat and tears and blood. That's the nature of war. I hope a minimal uh, loss of death toll for ourselves. And I hope also that, that uh, minimal damage to civilians who, who do not have uh, did, did nothing wrong except for being held under gun to the temple by the Hamas people. Uh, out of the over one million people in the northern part of the Gaza Strip moved to the southern part, already moved on, on foot. It's not unlike Canada, we are a tiny, tiny uh, country, much, I, I believe, even smaller than Nova Scotia. But um, a very tiny, so in the Gaza Strip, which is uh, probably 120 square miles, they can walk on, on, on foot uh, from the northern part to the Southern part, and you can see it on TV every afternoon. Uh, so, so well, several thousand, probably tens of thousands are moving. Now there are only 150,000 uh, people held under a uh, point of a gun by the Hamas as a human shield. But 150,000 is a lot too many to, to be killed in, in attack. So we are doing our best to minimize it, to avoid it. We do not enjoy uh, seeing uh, innocent Palestinians being buried, but we have a compelling imperative to make sure that Hamas is destroyed physically and as a, as a potential uh, power to, to reign over the Gaza Strip. And I pref uh, prefer to see Palestinians coming there and taking control, backed by the Arab world. They've been financed with the, by the Arab world to develop, to to rebuild, to, to, to create of it a normal place for human beings to live. Former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak expressing his continued belief in a two-state solution, but also calling for the destruction of Hamas as it presents an existential threat to the state of Israel. Now, another attendee at the Halifax meeting was British MP Alicia Kearns. She's the first woman and the youngest person ever confirmed by Westminster to chair the UK House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee. And she told the meeting Israel should be approaching its campaign against Hamas very differently. I want to begin 
with the very fact that you raised the alarm of potential violence in Gaza long before it happened, why do you think your warnings were ignored? I mean, look, none of us saw it happening in the way it had. And yes, I said that we'd see the Gaza crisis of 2023, but I never imagined the crimes against humanity that we saw perpetrated against Israel. Um, it is difficult. There is nothing easy about the Middle East. But I think with the focus, the tilt, as the British government previously called it, to the Middle East, uh, to the Indo-Pacific, that was a tilt away from the Middle East. You can't tilt to something without tilting away from something else. And the Middle East is difficult. It's complex. There's no easy wins. Whereas as the UK over the last few years, it's very easy to be the number one supporter of Ukraine, you know, to get that glory, to enjoy that position. Um, and so I think sometimes the hard work can fall behind the scenes, but also there were no easy answers to this. You know, it would have, it needed hard work and it needed sustained hard work. So why do you think Hamas launched its attack on October the 7th? So large, so brutal, and yet they must have known Israel would respond because they weren't acting in the interest of the people of Palestine, let alone the people of Gaza. Um, look, on the, on, I remember doing an interview the day after and I was asked exactly this, why, why do this? And the only answer I could come to was that it was about Iran. And we've seen an increasingly assertive, increasingly muscular Iran, whether it be in Iraq, whether it be in Yemen, whether it be in the UK, on our UK streets. You know, Iran has become more and more assertive. And yes, I think a lot of it did have to do with Saudi-Israel uh, normalization processes, but it wasn't just that. Um, so I think there's a lot to be asked about where and what and why. And I think it's too early for us to say that we know for definite that it was only because of Iran, but you can't take Iran out of the picture. I want to pick up on a point that you said, the fact that Hamas was actually not interested in the well-being of the Palestinian people, because you say here in Halifax that Israel should not be calling this an offensive or a war against Hamas, but rather a counterintelligence offensive. Why the importance of that label? So they're not at war with the people of Palestine. They're not at war with the people of Gaza. But there is a terrorist group, a terrorist group that committed crimes against humanity, uh, who need to be taken out. A counterterrorism operation is very different to a war. A counterterrorism operation is more controlled, it's more measured, it's more patient, and it's very clear from that operation that you are not targeting civilians, but that you have a single focus. What we saw with the operations, for example, against Daesh, was that we weren't allowed to go into a territory to liberate it unless we had a reconstruction plan. Where's the reconstruction plan for Gaza? Who's going to reconstruct Gaza? Who's going to pay for that reconstruction? Counterterrorism operations allow you that space to breathe and allow the best possible space for political process. We are only going to end this with a political process. But when you announce a war on Gaza, all the civilians of Gaza may ask if they are a target. Neighboring countries may say, you're at war with Gaza. You're not trying to just defeat a terrorist group. So I think the distinctions are not just in how you prosecute it, but also the day after, how we get to peace. But it also the tactics you use, though, because if you were to call it a counterterrorism operation, we're seeing something arguably far larger than that right now. Yeah, we absolutely are. And so with the counterterrorism operation, again, you know, again, fighting ISIS, I think we did something like 300,000 hours of RPAS flying um, for every one airstrike that took place. Israel conducted 6,000 airstrikes in a week in Gaza. In Libya, we did something like 7,600 in a whole year. There is a demonstrable difference in that. Also, currently, Israel is focused on destroying civilian infrastructure. Now, is that to allow for a ground invasion so there's less house-to-house -house fighting? Is it so they can clear the space to do ground-penetrating attacks to get into the tunnels? I just don't know. But it is a very different type of tactic. And actually, an op a counterterrorism operation, I think, would have kept international support for longer, allowing Israel to truly eviscerate Hamas, but by doing so in a very measured, proportionate, disciplined way. But uh, we, we've heard it not only from Israeli officials, but American officials as well. They put the blame on Hamas. Yeah. They put the blame on Hamas for these civilian casualties because they say that they have spent these years building hundreds of miles of tunnels underground, particularly under civilian infrastructure, a place like hospitals and schools. What do you say to that? So there's no question, Hamas went in, they committed crimes against humanity and they attacked Israel. There is also no question that Hamas is hiding amongst civilian infrastructure and has done that for a very long time. 
but there is something called a collateral damage percentage that every military has and that's about making sure you're making sure you're upholding your Geneva Convention responsibilities under that there is a percentage that you agree to how much collateral damage how many civilians can be killed for every target that you prosecute and decide to take out I would challenge that Israel has not made it the right percentage. In the UK, it's always sat, as I understand it, around 2 to 3 percent. In the past, Israel's operated something as high as 20 to 25 percent. You still have to make decisions. Yes, if a terrorist group is using a civilian infrastructure, that is a war crime, but terrorists don't care. You know, we shouldn't be comparing Israel's actions to those of Hamas. One is a democratic country and one is a brutal genocidal terrorist organization. So yes, civilian targets, civilian locations, infrastructure can become legitimate targets, but you still have to decide as a country within the Geneva Conventions whether or not your strike is proportionate enough and how much collateral damage you are willing to accept. And I would argue that Israel is not getting that balance right as yet. The Israeli Prime Minister, we, we should point out though, of course you, you know this, has expressed his reservations, his doubts about a two-state solution. What's your reaction to that? So when I've met with Palestinians, they've also told me that they think a two-state solution is dead. When you meet with average Israelis, they also say that a two-state solution is dead. For me, I do not see how we make a one-state solution work. I do not see a future for that. Uh, but there is no question that over the last nine months, what we have seen from Netanyahu's government is far-right, ultra-orthodox, denial of the rights of Palestinians to exist, maps that have denied the existence of Jordan to hold on to its territorial integrity. And we have seen comments from the Knesset around, let's use nuclear bombs, let's you know, uh, raise Gaza to the ground. Contrast that to Ukraine. Ukrainian MPs have not been out doing interviews saying, let's destroy Russia, let's eviscerate Russia, let's drop a nuclear bomb on Russia. You know, these are not things they have been doing. And so I think there's a really important conversation there about the need the disparity. So Ukraine knew it needed to maintain international support. Israel seems to be taking the approach of doing as much as they can before they assume that they will eventually lose support. Surely we want Israel to be able to prosecute this operation for as long as they need to defeat Hamas, but they should want to maintain international support, not be essentially running the clock out. And of course, we have heard uh, more calls from international leadership to, for greater restraint, among them uh, the Canadian Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of this country, Justin Trudeau. Uh, what do you make of that call? What's your assessment of that call? So I think I'm, I feel very strongly that the lack of the use of the word restraint from the start was a major error. <clears throat> How Israel prosecutes this matters, and our ability, be it Canada, be the UK, to be a voice for rule of law, to speak plainly to our allies matters for our ability to be future arbiters of conflicts. If this was Canada or if this was the US that was doing what Israel is currently doing, we would speak out against them. We would say to them, you need to do better. We would still grieve with them. We would still want to help them defeat the terrorist group whose sole goal is to eviscerate them. It is an existential threat. But I'm concerned it took so long for many Western politicians to be able to talk about restraint. And now that we have a UN agreement to a humanitarian pause, we need to make sure that those happen and that they are genuine pauses where we can get aid in, get hostages out and help get our nationals who are still in Gaza out as well to safety. So, of course, we'll continue to watch what's happening between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. But, you know, before we're done, you compared what uh, Israel is doing to what Ukraine is doing. I do want to ask about that because during this conference in Halifax, you essentially say that the West has abdicated its responsibility to Ukraine with the kind of support that's been provided so far. What do you mean by that? Because we haven't done enough. We have given Ukraine enough to survive, but not to win. We have a choice. What, what are we looking to achieve here? What we should be looking to do is to make sure that Russia does not gain territory as a result of violence. Sovereignty cannot be achieved through violence. That's a message that matters for Xi Jinping and for many other people around the world to hear. And yet we consistently only give them enough to survive. And as Zelensky has said, since the appalling attacks on Israel, we have seen a slowdown in the delivery of artillery to Ukraine. And we're not even into the full winter phase yet. We have to stand by them. We have to support them fully. Ms. Kearns, I really appreciate the time today. Thank you very much. Thank you.
the chair of the UK's Foreign Affairs Committee, British MP Alicia Kearns. Now, her comments about the West failing Ukraine by not providing more weapons is something I talked about with Petro Poroshenko, the former Ukrainian president, as the two of us discussed the state of his country's fight for survival against Russia. I want to begin uh, with your assessment of Ukraine right now. Nearly two years into this uh, fight against Russia's invasion, how is the country doing right now? First of all, I am every week on the front line, delivering maximum we can assist. And for these 640 days also, we delivered more than 100 million euro to the armed forces of our private money. And I know exactly what uh, soldiers think, exact situation on the front line. And I can tell you that Ukraine surprised the world, not only from the beginning, but now. Because I'm proud that I built the armed forces since year 2014 together, by the way, with the Canadian forces, because first instructor who come to help me, uh, nine years ago, it was Canada. Australia, United States, and Great Britain. And with that situation, I think we have uh, three absolutely fantastic operations in Kiev, in Kharkiv, in Kherson. And what another thing's doing now, this is we beat Russian Navy in the Black Sea area. We do not allow Russia to block our Black Sea port and to weaponize food to weaponize energy, and Russia afraid even to appear in this zone because this is a new type of the war, and we start to use new uh, unmanned uh, vessel, uh, UAV, and many, many other things. But the situation is extremely difficult on the front line, both on the east and on the south. And uh, definitely, Russia... Uh, send a new and new part of the meat of the terrorists and more than 1,000 uh, Russian soldiers liquidate every single day. About ten, more than 10 tanks and armed personal carrier. But we definitely need the new stage of the war. The war when we have an ahead and privilege in technology, in drones, in radio, uh, electronic warfare system in counter battery and thanks to Canada we have which joined F-16 coalition send an instructor to prepare and to train our pilot we definitely need Air Force because now all our offensive operation providing in a condition of the full Russian dominance in the air is extremely difficult. You talk about what you need right now, and we did hear uh, Alicia Kearns, British MP, the chair of the UK Foreign Committee, and she said to everybody at this security forum that the West has failed Ukraine because the West has given Ukraine enough to survive, but not enough to win this war. What do you say to that? I know Alicia very well. She is very, uh, very wise and sober-minded uh, MP and friend of Ukraine. And I think the significant part of what he said is absolutely true. We have, if we take the message with the one uh, sentence, this is we have enough weapons to fight, but not enough weapons to win. But our purpose is not just to keep Russia and to have a positioned war. Our purpose is a victory. The only way how we can finish the war is a victory of Ukraine. And if we are, do not have this victory, this means that Putin will use the time in between the ceasefire to prepare to produce more weapons, more missiles, more jet fighter, and to attack again. Nobody knows where, maybe in Baltic states, maybe in Balkan, but Putin, the only way how Putin can to survive is to destabilize. Destabilize region, destabilize continent, destabilize world. How do you define victory against Russia? What does that look like? Two factors. First factor is weapons, sanction, and justice. And second factor is a full Ukrainian membership in NATO.
because there does not exist any other form of the security guarantee than NATO. You remember that we talk about Israeli type of the security guarantee which was granted to the United States, G7 to Israel. Does they stop attack of Hamas on uh, Israel in the Middle East? No. That means that when Russia ruined all post-war security mechanism based on the Security Council of the United Nations, that means that we have only one instrument. This instrument for sustainable security situation on the continent. And the name of this mechanism is NATO. What we need to join NATO, that all NATO member states to support it, we need two things. Thing number one, reform. Ukraine should be prepared for the NATO membership. By the way, the list of the reform uh, compare with the membership in EU and membership in NATO is 85 or 90 percent the same. And with that situation, my request, which I uh, present here, was please, our partners, all the NATO member states, uh, from General Secretary, please give us the list of the 10, 8, or maybe 5 the most important reform. Anti-corruption, security sector, rule of war and legal reform, these type of things, which was easy, accessible. And I promise you, I do my best to make this reform and to present it for assessment before the Washington summit. And the question of the reform and reform of Ukraine would be successfully finished because this is in our interest. We do it not for America, not for Canadian or not for NATO. And the second, is the Article 5. And Article 5, they say that it is not possible to have it during the war. Please, give us an invitation on Washington summit and put the special agreement that the uh, full membership of Ukraine in NATO would be first day of the peace. It would be enough for us. It would be very strong motivation and it would be guarantee for security. And that would have an impact on this yeah, war? Undoubtedly. Without the, even more, without that, nothing happens. How does it have an impact on the war? If, if you are able to have full membership the first day of peace, how would that type of signal change the war for Ukraine? Because I have no doubt that with the new technologies, with the new weapons, Ukrainian armed forces would be the same successful as 640 days. Please do not follow the Russian narrative that Ukraine loses in the war. This is simply not true. No, na no any NATO member states can demonstrate an offensive operation without air dominance like Ukraine did. No NATO uh, countries can demonstrate successful naval operation without Navy as Ukraine did. And no NATO countries can demonstrate the effectiveness of the uh, counter-offensive operation when Russia have a bigger number of troops than we are bigger number of artillery than we are, bigger number of the ammunition than we are. And even in this situation, our army, our armed forces make a miracle and demonstrate the progress. Please don't lose an optimism. And just keep in mind that Ukraine uh, and Russia, what is the difference? Russia is fighting against the whole world and Ukraine is fighting for the whole world. Russia is demonstrating because they expected that the democratic countries is weak. And that's why authoritarian Russia can win war like that within 72 hours. We demonstrate that democracy is stronger, undoubtedly. Just want to remind you that before the war, Russia spent from 60 to 80 billion dollars uh, as a military budget per year. You know how much Ukraine spent? Four. And even with that situation, and for with, under my presidency, before that it was less than two. And even under my presidency, we stop Russia. We make free from Russia two-thirds of the occupied Donbass. We stop Wagner team which, with number of almost 30,000 uh, fighters. And that was not a prisoner from the Russian prison, but that was the most prepared uh, Russian soldier who were trained 
especially for attacking in Ukraine. Please believe in Ukrainian victory, Please, because that victory would be victory of Canada, victory of US, victory of the whole free world. And the last argument, somebody speak about the money today. My answer would be the cheapest way to win the war would be support Ukraine, give weapons of Ukraine, and give an invitation to Ukraine, to NATO. Very simple three steps. And when Otherwise, you speak we will not only spend 10 times more money, because Russia will do not stop, but you will fight with your own soldiers. And this is, believe me, I know what does it mean. I am on the funeral of my friends, my party members, members of my team, every single week. This is a disaster. So, what kind of reaction are you getting then to your message? We have representatives here from across North America and Europe. How are people reacting to what you're saying? This is not just reception in the Halifax. First of all, I want to uh, use this opportunity to thank Canada and uh, Halifax team for bright, absolutely excellent organizing of uh, this meeting. Because based on this dialogue, we can have a strategy, exit strategy, uh, from the war and uh, I when I was asked uh, what is the exit strategy here on Halifax I said please I want to give you a piece of advice to read the, the words of the Senator McCain which he mentioned on the first Halifax forum about the exit strategy and he said the only exit strategy with Russia can be our success in our interpretation can be our victory. And for this victory we need unity. Unity inside of Ukraine, which I try to do my best to demonstrate, and unity in the world. And please do not use any other things. Uh, I mean, election, political, populism, to ruin bipartisan support of Ukraine. This is extremely dangerous for your own country. And don't play these dirty Putin games. And again, and other things. It is not exist any gray zone in war between Russia and Ukraine and in support and uh, global coalition. Because if you do not support of Ukraine, if you want to stay aside, if you want to put some additional condition to stop or to hook support of Ukraine, that means you are on the Putin side which is completely unacceptable because this site is the site X of evil. Russia, North Korea, Iran. Does anybody want to join this team? President Poroshenko, I appreciate the time today. Thank you for that. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Former Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko speaking to us at the Halifax International Security Forum. Now, President Poroshenko is not the only Ukrainian statesman raising the profile of his country at the forum. There was also Andriy Shevchenko. From 2015 to 2021, he served as Ukraine's ambassador to Canada. And while President Poroshenko acknowledges Canada's importance to his country, Mr. Shevchenko reminded us of how deep that relationship is, one that is rooted in history, family, and shared values. I want to begin uh, with your reflections on the relationship between Canada and Ukraine because of course as ambassador you spent much of your efforts in building the relationship. So how would you qualify, how would you describe Canada's support of Ukraine since Russia began this invasion in 2022? Well, if you talk to people uh, uh, in Ukraine and you mentioned Canada, you will see smiles on, 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 uh, on our faces. That's what we feel about Canada. We know that it's our closest ally, closest friend. And I think uh, uh, you have shown a great example how to support Ukraine in this difficult time. With your Operation Unifier, and that's how you train our soldiers and officers starting from 2015 with the weapons that you help us with and with the financial support. And most of, most of all with the very strong solidarity. We feel that. Thank you. But could Canada be doing more? You know, we just heard from Alicia Kearns, a British MP, also the chair of the UK's Foreign Affairs Committee. And she basically says the West has abdicated its responsibility to Ukraine by giving enough for the country to survive, but to not actually claim victory against Russia. What do you say to that? 
I think there is a lot of truth in, in uh, that view. Uh, I would also re reframe your question. It's not whether we can do more together, but what exactly we can, we can do uh, more together. And I think there are some uh, sectors where Canada is particularly strong. First, your country has a, uh, a very strong reputation in the international community. It can show an example. Whether we talk about sanctions, or we talk about uh, international decisions, or we talk about the decisions that are made by international organizations, that's where Canada's voice can be very strong. And of course, when it comes to weapons, when it comes to financial support, that's where Canada has been shown a very great example. So what you do matters a lot. That has a huge spillover effect. And what about support, though, from other countries, and particularly the United States? Of course, very important, but by November of next year, Things could change dramatically. If the polls are correct, Donald Trump will win the Republican nomination. And again, if the polls are correct, he could and would beat Joe Biden in a general election. Within Republican ranks, there are questions being asked about the level of financial support being given to Ukraine. Does, does that worry you at all? Uh, to some extent, and for two reasons. First, because we immediately feel when there are debates of this kind in Washington DC that has an immediate effect on the very specific material things that we get or don't get from, uh, from the US. But moreover, it's about setting the tone for the whole international coalition. Uh, obviously, America is the most important ally that we have uh, uh, to win this war. America has introduced this very successful Rammstein format where we have 54 nations sitting around one table and working together to defeat Russia. So any change in the tone in Washington DC is something which is immediately felt across uh, this table. But overall, we have a lot of confidence in, in America. We have a lot of confidence in this international coalition. Why? Because I think by now we have come to a very clear understanding. It's not about Ukraine. It's about our future. It's about uh, sustainable peace that we can build together for the whole planet. And to do that, we need to make sure Russia is defeated in this war and we strip Russia off its offense capabilities uh, for a long time. And we have some good success there. Some good success. Are, are you worried, though, that morale will break or that the, it's been already described as perhaps a, a war of attrition? that Russia will have more resources at the end of the day to, to, to win this battle against Ukraine? Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, we cannot underestimate the resources and the power that Russia has. And we cannot underestimate how much of these resources Putin can throw into this war. At the same time, if we look at the facts, we see some very important developments. In the first year of the war, uh, Russia lost more than 50% of its land operation assault capabilities. Its Black Sea fleet is dysfunctional. So we already see how Ukraine with its resistance and with the international support has greatly diminished the Russian capabilities to be a threat for the whole world. So we are on the right track. And our goal is not just to liberate the Ukrainian land. Our goal is to build sustainable peace and to make sure we can buy at least a several decades of peace for the European continent and for the globe. You mentioned the European continent and of course right now we have just heard from the EU uh, beginning negotiations to, to look at Ukraine's addition to that community. What would that addition mean for Ukraine? How enthusiastic are you about this decision? Well, there is so much enthusiasm and optimism about this. And um, you might remember that in 2014 we had the Revolution of Dignity, which was a lot about our desire to join the European Union. People died in the streets of Kyiv to defend their right to choose their destiny uh, for, for their country. Also, it's a pragmatic choice. We feel that it, it's a good choice for the European Union and for Ukraine. It will make all of us uh, uh, better, better off. And uh, speaking of the European Union, and we expect a very uh, visible progress starting from December when we hope to start negotiations on the uh, joining the European Union. We should also remember about NATO. Those two should go together. And if we think together about long-term, sustainable, cost-efficient security solution for Europe, for Ukraine, for our neighbors, 
then the choice is obvious. It should be through EU and NATO membership for, for Ukraine. And uh, I always, when I worked here in Canada, I always felt that uh, uh, Canada is like the biggest European nation outside of Europe. We're talking about values. We are talking about respect for human rights, for human dignity. That is something which is in the heart of the European Union concept. And Ukraine uh, will be very privileged to join the European Union. So what do you hope comes out of this Halifax Security Forum? Here we have delegates from many countries, uh, democracies in North America and Europe, talking about how we can support and defend democracy. When it comes to Ukraine, what do you hope they take from your country's message at this conference? What do you hope they do once Halifax is over? I feel uh, enormous and very touching support. I feel a lot of solidarity, a lot of empathy. And uh, I also feel uh, there is a lot of concern in there because uh, uh, I talked to someone who lives outside of Halifax and has a Ukrainian flag next to his uh, house. And uh, this man says, it's not a difficult thing to put a Ukrainian flag uh, uh, on a post. It's difficult to keep it there for a long time. And uh, I think we must make sure that those voices who say, well, probably we have to, to switch our focus to some other directions, that uh, uh, we have clear response uh, to that. And there are a lot of destructions. There are a lot of very important challenges we have to deal with. We have Israel, uh, we have political turbulence in Washington, D.C. We have many other challenges. That should not distract us from this focus. Dealing with Ukraine and dealing with the Russian aggression, we are working on something of really enormously huge strategic importance. And we cannot uh, lose this focus. We must keep our eye on this ball. Mr. Shevchenko, really appreciate the time. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Andriy Shevchenko. Of course, fostering relationships like the one between Canada and Ukraine and pursuing policies that achieve mutual goals is a big reason why there's even a Halifax security forum, something I discussed with former Conservative Cabinet Minister Peter McKay, who is a big reason why Nova Scotia has played such a big role on the international stage during these last 15 years. So you were instrumental in the founding of this forum, and I, I really want to begin there with you. Why did you think, and do you think, it was important, is important for Canada to, to be a part of a gathering like this, and also to host a gathering like this? Well, I think Canada has something to contribute. I'll start there. Uh, I had attended as Minister of Defense, and then previously as Minister of Foreign Affairs, conferences similar in nature, the Munich Security Forum, the Myanmar dog Dialogue that's happening this same weekend in Bahrain. And these big conferences would talk about issues very much pertinent to democracy and security and defense. One of the big differences being that they weren't all democratic countries. And we found increasingly that the, the conversations would get blurred or bogged down on some of these issues about the value of democracy. And I also found, to be frank, in the European context that Canada was sort of lumped in with the United States. It was America, Europe. And I remember feeling the frustration to the point where I said, well, we can host something similar in Canada, bring the world to our backyard, and give a particularly insightful Canadian view on, uh, on our contribution. I said to one colleague in the European Union once, I said, I can take you to the graves of over 100,000 Canadians as a demonstration of our commitment as a country, as a sovereign nation to world democracy and peace and security. Okay, so that is the belief leading into this forum. But the, if you will, give us a bit more of a, a practical example, because this year's forum, for example, very much focused on what it has termed the cranks, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. How does engaging in those issues with other democracies further Canadian interests? Well, it's, it's hard to, to sort of quantify it, but I'll, I'll give you a tangible example. Ehud Barak is here. Ehud Barak was my counterpart at one point when we started this security forum. He came here as Israel's defense minister. He met, and I, I don't want to call him out on this, but he met with a Palestinian representative of government here in Halifax. That would be unheard of 
to happen back in the Middle East. We've had U.S. Secretaries of Defense, U.S. Um, Secretaries of State, significant policy and decision makers here who chose to make announcements on behalf of their government while in Halifax. And perhaps more importantly, had bilateral conversations with people from around the world, some of whom, again, I would suggest it would be very difficult for those conversations to happen in their own countries. And yet there is a, uh, a certain security and sense of, of spontaneity that can happen at this forum that doesn't seem to happen elsewhere. Yes, there are set pieces and we're having good discussions on these panels, but the real magic of the Halifax Security Forum is these hallway encounters and pull-asides and spontaneous discussions that really, I think, can move the dial on some of the big issues. And, you know, with what's happening in Ukraine, obviously the attack on Israel by Hamas, and goodness knows what will happen in, in Taiwan. China's uh, been very threatening, to say the least. So we can have frank, real, and hopefully move the, uh, the outcomes to a better place by having influencers, decision makers, right here in Halifax, looking at each other eye to eye and talking uh, in real terms, not from talking points. Okay, so, so what you're saying really underlines the role that Canada can play internationally. But, but here we are, Canada is not a part of AUKUS, Canada is not a part of Quad. Is Canada losing its place on the international stage? Yes, there's no question. Uh, in spite of ongoing efforts, and, and I have to qualify that by saying this is not a reflection on who the Canadian Armed Forces are or the efforts of our diplomats. This is unfortunately a, a reflection of priorities. And while the rest of the world, I think, are responding differently to the geopolitical shifting sands where we're seeing more violence, there's certainly more volatility, uh, more fear of more conflict happening. Most countries, Germany, counterparts in, in NATO, they're upping their investment. They're putting the resources behind preparedness, readiness, ability to deploy, ability to protect. And we saw it during Afghanistan, we were moving towards that elusive 2% of GDP commitment for our NATO membership. Uh, we moved away from that. And you know, there's, there's no question that there, there's an economic component to this and the performance of our economy is of course a, a big consideration and competing priorities. But defense is a major priority. And it's, uh, it's frankly something that I think most Canadians understand just from watching the nightly news. We need modern fighter aircraft. We need ships that can deploy. We need the ability to refuel those ships. And most importantly, Michael, we need the trained men and women in uniform who are able to perform these very dangerous tasks that we ask of them. They sign up with unlimited liability. Canadians, I think, got a new appreciation of what that meant during the Afghanistan conflict and what it means for their families. Okay, we, we should note the fact, though, that the defense minister is here, Bill Blair, helping uh, essentially open the forum this year, and he did make a multi-million dollar announcement into Diana, which is the uh, defense innovation accelerator for the North Atlantic. What do you hope the federal government does in response? What do you hope it hears and reacts and does in government based on the conversations being had here in Halifax? Backs up commitments, backs up announcements. Um, you know, there was references to the, uh, the shipbuilding contract. That was put in place 12, well, 2012, um, 30 plus billion dollars. The ships are coming, um, not as quickly as we would want or as we need them. So a training facility is, is great news. And, uh, and I applaud and thank the minister for that. Um, the aircraft, fighter aircraft, imbroglio, let's call it, became a political football. We saw that with maritime helicopters. That's unfortunate. And if there was one thing that I would underscore, it's, it's the hope, and I think Halifax also reinforces this, that these are not partisan issues. Uh, these are national issues. These are security issues. These are global issues. We need to see greater cohesiveness and, and a more what NATO calls comprehensive approach, interoperability, uh, having the ability to work together not just as a nation or a small group of nations as is the case with NORAD, but the ability to work in a theater of operations where the stakes are simply too high to have any margins of error. 
Thank you, Enrique. I always appreciate the time. Thank you for this. Thank you, Michael. As we mentioned earlier in the program, this year's forum focused on what's been termed as the crink. China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Big state players that present a challenge to democracies worldwide, but also discussed was Hamas, a terrorist organization that grabbed international attention again in October of 2023. So in a world with so many challenges to liberal democracies like Canada's, do we have the military capacity to stand up to potential threats and answer the call of our allies? It's a matter I discussed with the chief of Canada's defense staff, General Wayne Eyre. So here we are at this security forum, and when we think about Canadian forces, we know right now there are issues of recruitment, there are issues regarding equipment. I'm wondering how you would describe the state of Canadian forces right now and its preparedness to answer the call if an ally should need our help. So I think if we just take a step back and, and look at the themes that are emerging from this conference, it was very clear from all of the panels that the world is on the cusp of, or has already uh, passed the cusp of a change in the international order. Um, as we see what has been called in some corners a polycrisis of, of continuing emergencies, continuing crises around the world. And so that means that Canada is going to continue to be called into crises and, and have to deal with, uh, with threats and risks around the world, but, but here at home as well. And so what that means for us in the Canadian Armed Forces is the demand signal has gone way up. Uh, the, the, uh, the requirement to be able to respond to multiple crises, uh, often concurrently, it, um, it, it really consumes our bandwidth in terms of planning. Uh, but moreover, uh, we, we do not have the capacity to respond to everything. And so what that means is a few things. You know, one, we've got to very much prioritize uh, what we respond to. But two, we need to rapidly, urgently uh, rebuild our readiness. And, and what do I mean by that? Uh, we take a look at the, uh, the components of readiness. People. Uh, we are short people. And so recruiting and retention, reconstituting uh, the Canadian Armed Forces from a people perspective, super important. Equipment. Our serviceability rates are low. Uh, that's a, uh, a factor of having you know, relatively old fleets in some cases. Uh, not the spare parts, not the, uh, the maintenance contracts in place to be able to, uh, to get that serviceability level. And it's across all, all elements, Army, uh, Navy, if you take a look at our ships, aircraft serviceability in the Air Force, and, and so that needs to be fixed. Um, and then uh, sustainment. And, and what I mean by that are those enablers that allow us to do our job. Ammunition, uh, critically low. Our infrastructure uh, needs a lot of, uh, of work. Uh, in some cases, it is, uh, it's in critical shape. And so all of those elements together form the basis of readiness that we need to work so much on, uh, which, will, uh, which will drive our ability to respond to these emerging crises. But the other stressor in the international environment, security environment, is a rapid technological acceleration, uh, uh, acceleration of change. And we're seeing that play out in uh, Ukraine right now. We're seeing it in the capabilities that uh, like countries like China are investing in. And so uh, this has got the promise and the threat of, of, of dramatically changing the character of war. And so to remain relevant, there is new capabilities that we need to invest in uh, to, be, to be able to operate um, and be relevant against the threats and be relevant to our allies. Okay, but if an ally were to call on Canada to step up right now, how ready is Canadian forces to answer that call? Well, we would have to make some hard choices and stop doing something. Um, and, and so if we were to focus in one part of the world, it would have to come at the expense of, uh, of something else. Uh, you, right now, we're in the process of, of, of building up in Latvia uh, to, uh, to brigade level. That is consuming a lot of the capacity that's, that's in the Army, not all of it, but, uh, but the majority of it. Uh, we have increased our presence as part of the Indo-Pacific strategy in the, uh, the Indo-Pacific region. And of course, we're trying to do more in the Arctic. And so we're at that point where if we we're going to be called upon to do something else, uh, something would have to give. Okay, but does it worry you though? Like, does it worry you that here we are, the, the federal government looking for savings, and among those savings, a billion dollars from the DND budget? Does that concern you? Well, of course I'm worried. 
you know, it's hard to get blood from a stone. Um, and at a time when the international security situation is, uh, is rapidly deteriorating around us, uh, we should be going in the other direction in order to build that readiness, to build that relevancy that I talked about. I wonder, as you talk about all these areas where Canadian forces might be called upon to step forward, I wonder if it would be helpful, because it has been suggested, if Canada created a federal emergency management agency, or a FEMA like they have the United States, would that help to respond to the natural disasters here at home to free up Canadian forces to, to deal with perhaps more international or global concerns? No, yes, it would. Given the increased frequency and intensity of natural disasters, uh, the demand is going to be there. So what is required is more capacity, uh, a humanitarian workforce, if you will, at the provincial and municipal level, and so that uh, they can be that force of first choice. I have no doubt that the military, you know, give, just given how prevalent these natural disasters are, the military will continue to be called. Uh, but let's be truly that force of last resort instead of what we are now, that force of first choice, that as soon as there's a um, uh, the threat of a disaster in a province, we've got uh, provincial governments putting up their hand and calling for the military. No, we've got to be that, uh, that true force of last resort and there needs to be more capacity at other levels. I wonder what your message is to Canadians though, because I think many countries talk about defence. Uh, I don't know if Canadians speak about defence enough. But from what you've heard here, what do you want Canadians to know about Canadian forces and what we are called upon to do as a country and how we might move forward? Well, firstly, we are the country's Canadian forces. Uh, and the world is rapidly changing. It's becoming much more dangerous. As, as we face this danger, it re will require a whole of society effort. Canadian forces can't do this alone. And so we as a country, we as a society need to uh, determine, is our country worth defending? And if so, do it. If so, ensure that your Canadian Armed Forces are, are ready. And that's going to require some decisions. Uh, but we can't do this alone. And as we take a look at the, the global security environment that's going to dramatically affect our country, dramatically affect our vital national interest of prosperity, uh, if we don't do something about it, well, it's incumbent that we as a country act. General Ayer, I appreciate the time today. Thank you for it. Oh, thank you. Of course, General Eyre only executes decisions made by the political leaders of this country, and currently the Minister of National Defence is Bill Blair. We too spoke in Halifax as we talked about Canada's state of defence readiness and that 2% of GDP commitment that Canada has made to NATO. You know, here we are in Halifax, the 15th time Canada has hosted this international forum really underlining Canada's ability to bring together like-minded countries to tackle the big issues of the day. But at the same time, we are not part of AUKUS. APEC just happened. We are not part of the discussions regarding Quad. What does that say to you about Canada's standing in the world? Are we still respected militarily, strategically, on intelligence? I, I, first of all, yes. On, on, on all of those fronts, I, I believe very much. Not only are we respected, but we are a valued partner in, in all of those relationships. But at the same time, I'm not sure we have to be at every table, but Canada has a unique ability to convene very important tables, and because we are a trusted partner. You know, yesterday, as, as the forum began, um, our host, uh, Peter, said that, you know, you can't always pick your neighbours, but if you could pick, Canada would be the one you would pick. And, and I've, I've been meeting bilaterally with our, our American colleagues, with NATO colleagues, and people from around the world. And in every case, they express to me the, 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 how much they value Canada and Canada's relationship. And, and frankly, what we often hear, I've had a number of discussions with them as well, they want more of Canada. And, and so we've got work to do to, to be able to provide that, that more that they seek. The world's become an increasingly dangerous place. I don't feel I have to be at every table. But when we're needed, we're there. Okay, they want more of Canada, but does that mean hitting the NATO target? Because we're still not reaching that 2% that we're required to be. I, I think if people just take a very simplistic view and look at this, this spreadsheet, you're right, we're not there yet. But, but I think, if, and I asked them to look, we've made real progress. You know, t 10 years ago, we were actually below 1% of GDP. And since we formed government, 
and it's, it's beginning in, particularly in 2017, we began to, uh, Canada's defense, in, defense on a trajectory of new investment, increasing it by almost 70% over a six year period. But as we began that trajectory, and we've been making real progress on it, we also found that the threat environment was changing significantly. 15 months ago with the invasion of, 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 of Ukraine, a, an increasingly concerning activity among hostile actors such as Russia and China, Iran and others, which, which is changing, I think, the demand on us. And what we've also seen since the invasion of Ukraine, that our obligations to NATO have really become front and center. Canada punches above its weight in many respects in, in the NATO relationship. Our, our contribution is really valued. But at the same time, we know we have to increase our capability so that we can deliver on our obligations. And, and so it, it, it's still an important conversation. One of the things that I'm working with my government and our, and our finance minister, the, the Canada's current fiscal situation is not an easy one. There are many demands for in housing and in health but also in defense. My job for our government is to make sure that those defense requirements are well understood. And my other obligation is to make sure that when money is allocated to defense, that we spend it well, that we invest it in, in real value for Canadians, that we be able to cut through some of the red tape of procurement, that we do a better job of recruiting and retaining the right people for the Canadian Armed Forces, and that we build that real capacity. And, and that's the job. And, and it's, 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 it's a very significant, but it's an essential undertaking. Mm -hmm. Essential, as you say. Is it made more difficult, though? Because you, know, you, you referenced the, 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 the difficult decisions that have to be made right now financially for this country. But to my understanding, the ask is a billion dollars less for D&D. So what no, impact no, is really that going to have? What Treasury Board asked, that was not a cut to our budget. What Treasury Board asked of all departments, and because I have the largest department, and, 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 and there's a lot of expenditure there, is to make, ask us to make sure we're careful with the money that we are spending. You know, every year in the sense budget, notwithstanding we need more, we have not been successful in spending the money that we have available to us, because our procurement processes need to be streamlined and made more effective. Some of our recruitment and administrative processes and Treasury Board asked us, and it's not on, I used to run a large bureaucracy, as you know, Michael, and, and every once in a while I always found it useful because you're spending taxpayer dollars to go and make sure you're spending them well. And so they've asked us to look at consulting dollars, professional service dollars, executive travel. These are all things that don't necessarily contribute to our preparedness and our defense capabilities. But, but because we're spending taxpayer dollars, Treasury Board asked us to be careful in how we do it, and I agree completely with that. So we're going back and we're looking at how we can be more efficient, but, but that, that doesn't in any way diminish Canada's commitment to make sure that we're also more effective and that we invest in that, that, that preparation and those capabilities that are essential and that we have to deliver. But, it, but they want us to make sure that we're doing it in a way which is respectful and careful. Every dollar is an investment in, in the public value, and for me, that public value is the defense of Canada. Okay, let me pick up on a couple of points that you made. Sure. Uh, the, the first point, had to be about where we need to improve. Where do you see that money needing to be invested in? What needs to be prioritized right now to make sure that D&D &D and Canadian forces are able to respond to our international partners yeah, if and when they call upon us? We've made some very significant investments already, but we've got to deliver on them. We've got a new national shipbuilding strategy. We've, we've already delivered four Arctic uh, offshore patrol uh, uh, vessels. We need 16 new surface combat ships. And so we're uh, just down at the Navy Yard here in, in, in the, the Irving Yard um, here in Halifax. The work is beginning there and they're, they're creating great, a great workforce of Canadian workers to build those ships. We, we've committed $38.6 billion to NORAD modernization. That's, that's a significant new investment in new technologies over the horizon ra radars and, and over the polar radars and, and new multi-use infrastructure in the Arctic. Those are significant investments. We've got money that we're spending right now on, on new aircraft on multi-mission air, aircraft, and that decision is, 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 is coming very, very shortly. We're moving forward on that. But I think the greatest challenge that we face right now is people. The men and women of the Canadian Armed Forces, they're the ones that do all the heavy lifting and do all the work. And buying the best ship and the best plane, munitions, etc., are all very, very important. But I need to be able to recruit and retain the very best people for the Canadian Armed Forces. And right now, like many ar of the armies right around the world, it, it's a challenge. We're trying to make sure that 
our, our armed forces are inclusive and welcoming and supportive of the men and women who serve. We want the very best of people, but that's, that's the great challenge right now, is getting the people that we need to do the job, and then my job to make sure that they get the best platforms to work on, the best equipment to use, because we've got, we've got important work to do, and I need those people, and they need the right equipment to get the job done. So is there a plan? You talk about recruitment. Is there a plan to address that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've already begun it. One of the things we looked at last year, just as an example, is, is we, we know that, like previously, we required a person to be a Canadian citizen to join the armed forces. We recognize that there are literally thousands of people that live in this country, permanent residents, they've made a commitment to this country, and they would, be, they would make great members of the service. So we've opened it up, and several thousand people have applied who are permanent residents. We're working through that now. The other thing we recognize is the diversity and the inclusiveness of our armed forces makes them stronger and more effective. But we've got to make sure our armed forces are welcoming, supportive, and safe for women and members of visible minority communities. And that's really an important part of my mission as well, to bring about that cultural change because a diverse organization makes better decisions and is more effective, but, but you have to be worthy of that diversity. And to be that way, you've got to be supportive of it, respectful of it, and to create a truly inclusive environment. It's, it, it, it perhaps is the most important work that we have to do because I want everybody who joins the Canadian Armed Forces, first of all, to know the pride of service and the work that they do, but also to know that they're valued and, and that we are prepared to make sure that they have a safe work environment, one that, that really does feel both respectful and inclusive. Let me pick up another point that you made, and that had to do with procurement, because you're talking about streamlining a process, and I think that is, I think it's a fair question many Canadians are asking right now. How is it possible that Canada moves quickly to arm uh, Ukraine in the, its defense of its country against Russia, and yet we seem to have procurement issues here? Where do you see the streamlining happening? What do you think needs to change in order to, to, to make procurement more efficient and more quick? I, I think, first of all, many of those procurement processes, for good reason, are risk adverse. But at the same time, in times of urgency, you have to move urgently. And, and I think what we're seeing, for example, with munitions for Ukraine and for the Canadian Armed Forces, there's an urgent need now. And so I think part of it is, is streamlining our processes, but another part of it is a different type of a relationship with Canadian military industry. And they require, because I've met with them, they require certainty and clarity from us. On, on, the, on the Canadian Armed Forces we're building and what we're going to require. And then that will enable them to invest in the supply chains and the product production lines that will enable them to provide us with the materials we need. It really needs to be a, a more collaborative partnership, and, but we have to recognize we, we don't have the luxury of time sometimes. There is an urgency to some of the things that we require because a lot of our material, our ships, are beginning to age out of service. So we're working really hard to get them built. Some of the planes are no longer fit for purpose. And so we've got to get them the right equipment to do the job that's required. And that's really going to require close collaboration with the Canadian military industry, the aeronautics industry, and with our allies and partners as well. Because we work in a very collaborative world now with NATO, with America, in, in NORAD, in the Asian Pacific, through with our Five Eyes partners. And so issues of interoperability, compatibility and exchangeability are also important considerations. Okay, so here we are in Halifax for the security forum. You've been listening to the many concerns being expressed here. What do you think Canada will be called upon to do? What should we as a country be ready for? Well, three areas internationally. We've, we've been asked to, to contribute more in, in the NATO environment. We've put our hand up and we, we're taking leadership in Latvia, in establishing a forward presence there of, of, of brigade strength. Canada is leading that in, in Latvia. The, the, the Britain is in Estonia, the Germans are in Lithuania, and we're in Latvia. And as a major in NATO partner, we're really stepping up in that area and we're going to be a persistent presence in, 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 in NATO in order to keep Europe safe because that's the front line in, in our concerns with respect to Russia. There's also the issue for us of the Arctic. It's why NORAD is so important, but we are seeing a more persistent threat from both Russia and China in, in the Arctic, and we have to respond appropriately, which means investments in a persistence presence in the Arctic. That also requires, by the way, 
close consultation and collaboration with, with territorial governments, but also indigenous and Inuit governments in, in those regions. And so that's really important work that we're doing. Canada made a commitment to the Indo-Pacific, and we've heard discussions today about concerns in the Indo-Pacific. You know, historically, I think our presence there was pretty episodic. We'd occasionally send a ship through. We, need to, we, know, we know we need to be there more persistently to, to make sure that the Canadian presence is meaningful and our partners can count on it. And so we're, do, we're doing that work. And then domestically, what we're also seeing in this country is climate change, wildfires, floods, and hurricanes have presented a huge challenge. We keep on asking the Canadian Armed Forces to come to the aid of their fellow Canadians, and they always answer the call. I've got to make sure that they're properly resourced, staffed and supported to be able to do that, because when Canadians need them, they've got to be there. Are the other ministers listening, though? Listen, I, this is a shared priority for our government. I, my government understands that one of the first priorities of all governments is the safety and security of, of their country. And so national defense is, is not just the responsibility of the Minister of National Defense. It's the, minister, it's, the prime, it's the Prime Minister's responsibility, it's Cabinet's responsibility, it's governments on both sides of the House responsibility. Minister Blair, thank you for the time. Thanks very much, Mike. Always good to see you. Canada's Defence Minister, Bill Blair. Well, that concludes our special coverage of the Halifax International Security Forum. I'm Michael Serapio. Thank you for joining us here on Profile. For everyone at CPAC, we appreciate your support. We'll see you again next time.